In part one of our introduction to perception, we began to see how our brain creates our reality, how it forms our understanding, how we perceive a reality based on the sensory input available. We discussed the importance of attention. We looked at the Gestalt concepts that helped explain how we organize our visual world, and we looked at how we perceive depth and motion. In part two, we will investigate the concept of constancy in perception. We will look at how we interpret this information, and we will see how experience, expectation, culture, and even emotion can affect perception. Let's start with the concept of perceptual constancy. This is our ability to recognize the object without being deceived by its changes in size, shape, brightness, or color. Let's look at this door as an example. If we look at this door and we watch the door open, in our brain we don't perceive the door as changing. Why would a door change? We understand what doors are. However, if we think about the actual image on the back of our eye, the shape of what's hitting our retina and how we understand it, and we outline the door, look at what the outline looks like. That image is very, very different shape than that image, yet our brain doesn't perceive that change. We have a constancy in our perception of the shape of the size of the door. How about another example? If you see a car approaching from the distance, the image on the back of your eye gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yet, we don't sense the car is growing, do you? If you do sense the car is growing, we have bigger things to talk about. In fact, as we talked about last time, this size distance relationships gives us lots of information about uh, distance and size, and it leads us to things like this uh, illusion here, where it appears that this monster in the background is a much larger size monster than the monster in the foreground, but again, the image on our eye, if we measure it, is exactly the same. Our understanding about the other depth cues says that by the time this monster gets closer to us, he's going to be much, much bigger. He's not going to have grown, he's just going to be closer. Let's look at the idea of lightness and con color constancy. The idea that color and brightness seem not to change even when the amount of light reflecting off them changes. Why? If you have an apple indoors amongst a bunch of other fruit and you took that basket of fruit outside, would the apple look any more red or would it look the same? Well, because everything around it also changes, in the context of the surroundings they look unchanged. We have a lightness, lightness and color constancy. But here's a fun little illusion. Look at box A and box B. Do they look the same color to you? The same amount of lightness? What if we cover up the rest of the context? If we take away the surrounding context cues, look how similar they are in color. This isn't a trick. Those two boxes are the same color, but the context cues around them deceive us. And I'll let you guess about the color, these two boxes in the middle, if they're the same or if they're different. Based on the context cues, they look very different. So what this means is that context matters. Now, let's move on to perceptual interpretation. And this is where things get a little bit more complicated. I'm going to move through this pretty quick, and I'm not going to spend too much time, because this is the type of uh, discussion we're going to have in class in greater detail. I'm just going to introduce the ideas now. We're going to talk about, in class, what happens when we're deprived of sensory information, or if we have restored vision later in life, and the, uh, the concept of a critical period in terms of the neural development that's responsible for the underlying neural architecture that allows us to have this ability to both sense and then perceive stimuli. We're going to spend a good bit of time on the concept of perceptual adaptation. How do we adapt our perception of the world? For example, if you were wearing a pair of goggles that had mirrors in them that turned the world upside down, how long would it take before you could adjust and uh, you know, be able to move and throw a ball and catch uh, without, without struggle? Especially considering that the image coming to your brain right now is already flipped upside down by the lens in your eye. One of the more interesting concepts that we're going to learn about in this part of the chapter is the concept of a perceptual set or a mental predisposition. What do you already know? What do you expect to happen? These things greatly affect how we perceive an event. And I want you to think of any time where you and another person experience the exact same thing, 
but your perception of it was very different. It's all based on what your past experience is. It, it's uh, based on what your expectation was. It's also based on things like culture and even emotion. This perceptual set or mental predisposition can bias us uh, towards how we experience an event or make us ready to perceive it in a certain way. So we'll, we'll pay attention to certain sensory inputs but ignore others. Now I'm not going to give away all of our fun examples that we're going to use in class, but let me just give you one. If I spent 15 minutes telling you a story about a duck, and then I showed you this picture and asked you what you saw, think about what you might say. But if I had spent 15 minutes telling you a story about a rabbit, and I showed you this picture, what would you see? This relatively ambiguous stimuli can be perceived different ways, but your preparation, your expectation, could affect how you perceive it. I'll leave the other examples for class. But the point is, uh, what we perceive can be influenced by expectation and context. It can also be influenced by emotion or motivation. We'll talk in class about how uh, we'll, we'll discuss this in class in greater detail and give lots of uh, examples. I don't want to use all of them now because that's what class is for. But some of the things that can influence our perception is our bodily needs. How do we perceive something if we're hungry or tired or when you know we have some physiological need? How do we perceive it based on if we're rewarded or punished for perceiving in a certain way? Emotion and connotation our individual values. How does your personality affect how you perceive something? And how does the value of objects uh, affect how we perceive them? We'll talk about this in, with a bunch of examples in class. And finally, we'll talk about the effect of emotion on perception. Um, emotion and also culture and experience. We'll ask questions like this. Uh, how about this, the Meyer liar, the Mueller liar illusion? Which of these lines is longer? the red one or the blue one. Well, if you take out your ruler and measure, which we will, that line is that long. And you guys you probably expected by now, that line is the same length. Yet, the context of these other lines near them uh, make us fall for this illusion. And we'll see what that means as far as how we see the world and how those lines, how we learn that those lines give us the context to give us depth. But what happens if you don't grow up in a carpentered world? Could the culture in your experience make you more or less likely to fall for this illusion? We'll discuss that in class. And how about this picture? Which one of these animals is closer to this man? Well, based on our prior knowledge and our understanding of you know space and depth, I hope you'd probably figure out that you know this animal's closer and that one's past back in the distance, but that's not always true. If you show this picture to people with a different past experience, they might have a different answer. We'll give that example in class also. So that's the end of part two of our introduction to perception. And uh, look over this, check out your notes, and we'll discuss the rest of it in class.